Uh, frantically shuffling their papers, <laughs> getting ready. <laughs> Tanya Bryant and Peter Lloyd. They are taking us through Thursday's newspapers. The pick of the stories. Um, welcome back. Thank you, SJ. Um, Tanya, we're going to talk about this story in The Telegraph. And this was um, news that our city editor, Mark Kleiman, broke exclusively yesterday. And city leaders, it seems, are refusing to sign a letter backing the government's stance on Brexit. That's absolutely right, yes. Uh, it was a leaked paper, Sky News got hold of it. And basically, the Prime Minister went to FTSE 100 company executives and saying, please, will you support our Brexit plans? We need your vote of confidence going forward. And they were refusing to sign it, which is quite interesting because you would think they would need to or mm. would have to support the government's stance. They're saying, actually, no, we don't have to. We want to wait to see what's going to happen. They want to wait to see. Of course, the other leaked paper we talked about today was on migration. They want to see what's going to happen mm. with EU workers, what are going to be the caps or not caps on that. So they're actually going against and saying, no, nope, we're going to wait. It's quite interesting, Peter. When I, I did see this last night from Mark Kleiman, I did have a wry smile because I thought they're probably the CEOs of big companies because they know not to sign anything <laughs> yes. or they've read yeah. the small print. Duh. Exactly. No one wants it's to. It's obvious. It's obvious. And also, you know, although no one wants to play footsie with Theresa at the moment. <laughs> um, I love that, that was actually from the mirror. That no, was it wasn't. Brilliant. It was my <laughs> own original. <laughs> Rumble. <laughs> no one wants to play footsie with Teresa. But, you know, you have to take this with a pinch of salt because when the EU referendum was happening, more than 300 business leaders signed a motion that supported Brexit. And, of course, even Mark Carney, you know, from Bank of England, he was uh, you know, a big member of Project Fear and forecast these terrible gl uh, gloom. Uh, and actually, you know, there was an economic growth mm. after Brexit. So all of these concerns, I think, we need to take with a bit of reservation. But okay. they did support Cameron in the 2015 election. OK. Uh, right, Peter, take me to the mirror. A lot of um, the newspapers are centering on this interview uh, that the Conservative Jacob Rees-Mogg gave yesterday, saying yeah. he is against any type of abortion, even if a woman is raped. Yes, so relatively controversial comments. He made them in an interview yesterday. Uh, he is, of course, a staunch Catholic, and these views are in line with his faith. And now, of course, everybody is very upset and outraged about this because it is a very sensitive topic. I appreciate that. But we have to remember that these are his personal religious beliefs. And they're not just his views. A lot of people have those. Views. Absolutely. And a lot of women, crucially, share these issues as well. And I always say this, like I posted a tweet yesterday that said, would the media and would we be this outraged if this were a Muslim MP making these comments? The views he shares are, are, are matched by would. many Muslims. Yes, I think they would, Peter. And I think the point here is that, understandably, those are his religious beliefs. That's what he believes in. But how much then would that inflict on his actual political beliefs? And if he were running the country, how much would that translate? Well, that's it, isn't that? it? And Peter, should he not be commended for standing by his views, however distasteful they may seem to a lot of people? I think it's in the, the Daily Mail today. Sarah Vine is saying she disagrees with him yeah. as a woman. However, he's standing by his principles. How many politicians do we criticize for when we are asking their exactly. personal, mm. personal views they avoid the question I mean Tim Farron couldn't escape questions about his no. religion throughout his uh, leadership of the Liberal Democrats yeah precisely and we, we pride ourselves on being a nation of diversity but strangely enough when it comes to diversity of thought which is perhaps the most important form of diversity people lose it. It's, it's a sound state of affairs that he can't have an opinion which is separate from his policies. I think he can have an opinion, but I think it will actually impact his policy. And that's the whole point. How much would it impact? But he is being applauded for being honest. He was asked a direct question and he gave an honest answer. And if he is being touted as a potential leader of the Conservative Party, we in need the future, to know. People now know we have to know. So there you go. You know what you're getting. Uh, Tanya, Hillary yes. Clinton in The Guardian. Oh, yes. So she's come out. There have been lots, <laughs> lots of books written about the campaign. There was one very good book I read called Shattered uh, and explained, you know, what happened within the campaign. Where do you lie the blame? What went wrong? Was that how tired she was after the campaign <laughs> or was that the glass ceiling? I can't quite work it out. The, uh, the, the glass ceiling. But this is actually in her own words. She's coming out. The book's coming out next week. What happened? Now, she does take responsibility and, she, of course, she has to and lie blame with herself. And she does do that. However, what she does pinpoint is Bernie Saunders not being a true Democrat. Who she betrayed. And who, yes. 
And she also, of course, puts the blame on the emails. She says, quote unquote, I was dumb to do that, but she felt the timing of that was actually against her. And interesting enough too, she felt sexism played a huge role in her failure. And just finally, very quickly, on the last day of the campaigning, she was there with Obama. Obama gave her a hug and he said, you've got this. Well, well it turns out not so much. Never right. trust that. Don't trust <laughs> that last day when someone um, says that to you. Peter, you've chosen a story from the Huffington Post online. One in eight people are skipping meals just to get by. Yeah, it's quite an interesting story, actually. So apparently the state of British workers, they are earning such low salaries that they're actually trying to skip lunches to save just a few pounds mm. every day. Apparently that is how, how desperate the, 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 the situation is for most workers. That said, I think we need to see it in context because this comes from a report by the TUC. And let's face it, the TUC aren't going to publish a report that says workers are all happy and content, are they? So. Yeah, but Peter, if that is the case and they can't, then we have to take it seriously. With everything else going on, the crux of the matter, people can't afford meals, yep. then really Prices that's... of food are going up, wages are not. Uh, Tanya, Peter, thank you for the moment. We're going to take a quick break and we'll have more stories for you after that. Through Thursday's newspapers and Peter, um, it's quite expensive to buy a pint now, but we have found the most expensive place uh, in the UK. And you had to go and try them all out. This is a, a lifetime's <laughs> worth of research into this story. I know. I'm amazed you made it yes. in this morning. Well done, you. Yeah, <laughs> staggered in. No. Uh, so if you're planning uh, a weekend getaway and you fancy a pint this weekend, do not go to Surrey because apparently okay. that is now the single most expensive place to buy a pint, even more expensive than London. Mm. The average pint is apparently £3.20 in the capital and it's £3.40 <gasps> in Surrey. Oh, but if why? you want to get a good deal, it might be worth getting on a coach, popping up to Yorkshire where it's only £3.20. Oh, make a weekend of it. <laughs> OK, there you go. That's, uh, that's the most expensive place to buy beer. Sorry if you live in Surrey, nipping down to your local. That's going to be costly. Um, Tanya, I love yes. this story. Um, this is in the mirror. It's in a lot of the pages today, uh, mm. newspaper today and it's the Guinness That's World right. Records yep. the weird and the wonderful I, I think love it's, it's just Guinness fantastic because you just think what are people gonna do to get into the book it's been going since 1955 it sold 138 million copies you worldwide to get one every Christmas yes it makes lovely Christmas present and now the new one launching for 2018 here we have look we've got a bunny rabbit and he's <laughs> into the record books for the most slam dunks. You've got a lady from China that's got the longest eyelashes, but look, Esther, the nails, the yeah, longest it's fingernails. the nails <gasps> that get me. They're at the bottom. Can we yeah. see that? Just, just, just going down. There it the is. The longest fingernails in the world. Look at that. How does she wash the hair? How do, we don't ask. Well, we saw her earlier on picking up a cup of tea. She uses the nails as hooks oh. and then goes around like that. It's a, it's a, it's a great story. What if she points at you? <laughs> Take your eye out, that's what happened. Uh, Tanya, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you again in the next hour. Uh, we're going to take a look at the weather now. Record-breaking storms uh, across the Caribbean, uh, a little bit more settled here, thankfully. Isabel has the details.